Okay, dokie. We are back for module number three in digital forensics. This module will deal a lot with uh, physical hardware stuff, namely cables and other media like that. It's really just a, a cover of various things that you would see in the field, depending on uh, the type of digital forensics work you do. For example, if you are part of the digital forensics team at an organization, and that organization has a standard system for all its users, let's say it's, it's a Dell whatever, and everybody has that same Dell system, then doing forensics becomes a lot easier because you'll have, you have multiple systems who are exactly alike. So you don't have to have special cables or, or a kit of, of different things. Your, your, um, your physical kit will be all the parts that make up that system. If you end up working for like law enforcement or uh, one of those private companies that does digital forensics for clients, then you're gonna have a closet full of every single cable and connection known to man. Which can be a little daunting because you have to remember all the different types of cables, the different ways they connect, the, their speeds and all that. So it, it really all depends. It all depends what kind of gig you get. Again, working at a company who has a standard system for everybody, it's going to be much easier. Everything else is going to be a little bit challenging. So here's a question for you. What is this? And not the obvious answers of a cable. Ribbon cable, yeah, that's just, that's not specific enough. What kind of cable is this? It is not IDE, it is not SATA. And it's not PCI either. This cable is the Small Computer Systems Interface, otherwise known as SCSI. It is not the super old printer one. It is not the parallel port. This thing used to connect hard drives and be able to daisy chain them together. I think it handled like 30 disks or something like that. And again, this is in the age when the when a quote unquote large drive was like two gigs. Now this connection might be a little familiar. You don't want to take a stab? Yeah, Pedro's got this one. This one's IDE, the Integrated Drive Electronics. Uh, primary difference between SATA and IDE is the number of pins, and IDE always had one missing. There's the cable for IDE. This, this is what I'm talking about, the difference between uh, forensics for an organization and forensics for anyone. Because you don't know what and anybody has. There are systems out there that still use these old connections because the organization's motto is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I used to have a client who made headlights for motorcycles 
and use DOS to tell the machine, the, the CNC machine to make the headlight or headlamp, however, uh, whatever specifics with whatever, uh, whatever stuff written on it or drawn on the thing. And that thing would occasionally go down because super old, but they wanted the parts to keep it alive. Now this one should be easy. Yep. What's this one? If this one is SATA or SATA, what's this? It is not ESATA. Nope. It is indeed a power cable. So what's this guy? Yeah, now Pedro got it right. That is an eSATA cable, not a display. Moving right along into cloning hard disks. Hard disk or solid state, same difference. Uh, well, for right now. There are two main processes used to make bit for bit copies of a disk. There is a clone, which is an exact copy of a hard drive and to be used as backup. And there is the image, a file or group of files that contain bit for bit copies of a hard drive, but cannot be used for booting or any other operations. Because we are remote and are not in a lab, we're not gonna be dealing with clones. We're going to be dealing with images. So again, a clone is an exact copy of a hard drive that can be used as the, the main drive that was copied from. You could swap it out with another, start the machine and it will boot. A image does not boot. An image is just a file or a group of files that have bit for bit copies, but are unbootable. Cloning a drive is faster than imaging. Before an investigation. Uh, before an investigation, the hard drive, the harvest drive must be sanitized because uh, you, you will get that question from attorneys. Uh, you wanna make sure that the drive who you're gonna copy into is completely clean. It's also helpful to identify the specifications of the suspect's machine, like the make and model. Uh, that way you have plenty of information about the computer you're gonna be working with, learning how to remove the drive, because you know every manufacturer has a different. I see a question. When cloning, do you have to use the same type of hard drive? Ideally, yes, which again makes life so much easier if you are dealing with the same type of system. If not, just like I just uh, said, you'll need to do the research on the make and model to find out what type of drive is typically on it and get a drive very similar, if not the same make and model, so that you can have a perfect uh, clone of the drive. And a lot of forensics 
uh, forensics organizations or teams, they go through a lot of hard drives because they have to they have to be able to prove that they're all uh, that they're never used before, that they're totally sanitized. And the best way to do that is to buy a new one. So their budget on drives is uh, over the roof. Solid states, which we know and use and love because they're faster. Solid states are the non-volatile storage devices uh, that have memory chips in the stationary layout of transistors. Therefore, no moving parts. Hooray. Most SSDs are flash memory and NAND devices. In a single cell, uh, in a single cell flash, each cell has one bit. In a multi-level NAND flash, each cell has two or more bits. Due to the number of manufacturers, there are a variety of controllers and firmware which affect how garbage collection, caching, wear leveling, encryption, compression, dead block detection, and more occur on the drive. So um, SSDs are more unpredictable. SSDs are more efficient given their use of power faster retrieval and storage of files and greater resistance to environmental factors like heat and vibration uh, while suffering from wear leveling, which is the process by which over time, areas of storage becomes unusable. From a file perspective, solid states are different from hard drives and don't use the traditional 512 byte storage sectors. Recovering deleted files on an SSD is more challenging as a result of the garbage collection, which is the memory management process that removes unused files to make more memory available. Garbage collection can be unpredictable with, hard, with uh, solid states. This means that if you took two hashes of the same SSDs, they may not match. Unlike hard disk drives, solid states must erase data before a write can occur, completed in large blocks with high latency. The OS does not keep track of the physical location of the files. This task of the physical location is left to the file transition layer, which maps a logical block address to a physical block address. Trim is another operating system function that informs the solid state which blocks are no longer in use, increasing write performance. Trim runs immediately after the recycle bin is empty. Techniques have been developed to prevent trim and garbage collection from operating. And although still hashing issues exist, we know from case law that the evidence is still admissible because the court may be out of date, but at least they somewhat understand. I see a question. What would be the main difference between cloning and restoring a computer from backup? Well, a full backup may not be an exact clone. A full backup will typically be an image, a bit by bit copy into a file that's not necessarily bootable. And you use an application to take those bits and put them back into a drive. Then the drive will be usable. When we deal with forensics, we don't really want to use backups. They're, they won't give us the full picture of what was on that drive. Because the backup could easily skip any of the unused space to make the backup faster, more efficient, or whatever. And then during a restore, it may not put all the files back where they were, exactly in the physical locations. It'll be more logical. Which again is a problem for us, because we want to be able to see what 
happened on the drive, including deleted files and, and where they were. So making an image is much more, uh, is admissible in court over a backup. Good questions, keep them coming. Good old RAM is the volatile area, the volatile memory that is erased as soon as the computer is powered off. I have seen some research and uh, some hackers try to pull RAM immediately from a system and see what they can read off of it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That is definitely a gamble that you won't fry the motherboard or the, the memory chips before you're able to yank it out. But while the computer is on, RAM will provide you with a treasure trove of information, like all the internet searches, all the websites visited, uh, any passwords that are currently saved in RAM. There is quite the treasure trove of information. And most of it is usually unencrypted because it has to be for the CPU to be able to process them. Now I say that for the most part because there are some apps who will stay encrypted, but for the, the grand majority, everything that happens in RAM is usually unencrypted. There is also RAID, and not the one that killed the bugs. The redundant array of independent disks. RAID is where two or more disks are used in conjunction with one another and provide increased performance and reliability through redundancy. Reliability in RAID refers to the fault tolerance, meaning if one of the components fails, like one of the drives, the system continues to operate. OS's view RAID as one logical disk with the use of hardware or software controllers. As forensic investigators, it's important to note the order in which each drive was added to the RAID array and which drive adapted its connection to which drive. Because you can't just take a drive out of a RAID array and try to rebuild the whole thing. Sometimes that just doesn't work, like a, a RAID 5 or a RAID 6 or a RAID 60. You got to know the order in which all the drives were in so that you can rebuild the array and be able to copy it and, or to make an image of to work on it from there. Hey, here's another cable question. What is this? Pedro is on fire. Get it, get it? Yes, indeed. This is Firewire. This was a competitor to USB 2.0. How's that doing for you, Firewire? It was replaced by Thunderbolt. Just another cable to have in mind, again, if you're dealing with different types of systems, especially like old ones. And then we're gonna do a quick uh, hairpin turn right here into USB flash drives. I remember in the previous module, I said each time a drive is, a yeah, device is connected to the computer, there's information stored in the registry. Well, that also applies to things like USB drives. Every time a USB drive is connected to a Windows system, it is saved in that location. The ID of it. Why is that important?
No, time stamps maybe. Think in a in a courtroom. Yes, Eileen. You can prove whether someone was using a certain device. Yes, by going into this location and registry, you can see what USB devices were connected and you could correlate that yes, indeed, this, this suspect had this drive and connected it to that to their computer because here is the ID, here's the proof. Speaking of USB drives, there are the external drives you have the two main types, USB powered and externally powered. Within the casing is typically a SATA drive. With the drive out of the casing, it is possible to clone the drive. External drives are mostly used for backups or extension of computer's memory. An examiner should be aware of its use, including things like using BitLocker. Think before you remove any USB device that is connected to a live system, because they could be encrypted. And if, if it's connected and mounted to that system, it will be unencrypted. I see a question, can they be modified for disguise ID numbers? It's pretty hard to do that. Most don't have the tools or the, the technique to do that. And if they delete it, there is still a record on the drive. What is this? I mean, it's on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not an SD card. This is a multimedia card. Uh, this lost the race to SD cards. But again, if you're working in a in an organization that does forensics for clients, you need to have everything under the sun. This sucker here is a secure digital or an SD card. You have different sizes for different functions, like a digital camera or a laptop or a cell phone. You have the secure digital high capacity, the SDHC. There's also the SDXC, the secure digital extended capacity. Different types, different sizes, both physical and logical. Because the SDHCs go about 32 gigs, uh, SDXCs can fly up to a terabyte plus. This one should be easy because it says on the thing. You know, and if I was smart, I could flip the picture so that it's readable, but whatever. Compact flashes. You see them primarily in two places in cameras and in networking devices such as routers. Yeah, SD cards are definitely wild. So much data on such a tiny little thing. Sony attempted to get into the picture into making a proprietary card. 
and um, didn't quite survive now, did it? But just know that Sony does that a lot. They make a lot of proprietary stuff. Here's another who tried and failed to, to take the crown from SD is XD picture cards, extreme digital cards. With all those suckers and so many more, it is a good idea if you're getting yourself into the field, uh, if you're building a forensics lab to have a device similar to this where you can attach various different types of cards and not write to them. That's what this sucker does. It'll let you read. It'll let you do a, a complete image of the, the card without altering it. And now the optical family. Uh, oh, before I do that, I see a question. If you pop a card in your computer, is the risk that you'll later alter it? Uh, actually, Eileen, the, the risk is that you alter it at the moment. It creates a connection to the computer. Because there is a electrical process where the, the system, the computer writes to that, that card. And again, you don't want that to happen. Same with a, a hard disk or an SSD that you don't want anything altered. You want it in, in the state that it's in. So you use write blockers to prevent any, any form of writing to occur. All the write commands, uh, any anything that that from the computer that says to the system right just gets just gets uh, knocked out. So the the drive or the the card stays in the condition it's in. So. Ah, uh, discs, physical discs, opticals, polycarbonate plastic discs with one or more metal layers. Those are the compact discs. Data is stored and read using a laser, reaching temperatures about 500 to 700 degrees Celsius, causing the metal alloy to liquefy at certain points. The lands are the reflective surfaces on a CD. The pits are the less reflective surfaces that haven't been burned by a laser. The differences between the reflective and less reflective surfaces can be translated into binary. CDR, compact disc readable, are forensically sound since they can be written to only once. Your general storage capacity for them is 700 megabytes. ISO 9960, otherwise known as CDFS, is the standard for optical disks and their file systems. CDs can use Joylet, which uh, allow for longer file names, or use a variety of different formats like UDF, HSG, HFS, and HFS Plus for Macs. A .ISO file is an image of an optical disk. So if we need to do forensics on a disk, or we need a, a bit for bit copy, we make an ISO file. The standard ISO 9960 states that frames consist of 24 bytes and are the smallest unit of memory on a CD-ROM. A sector will be 98 frames or 2,352 bytes. Now, do you need to memorize every single little detail of that? No, this is not A+. 
but it's good to know. The CD re, uh, yeah, rewritable, compact disk rewritables. CDRWs tend to have less storage than the CDRs. A track is a group of sectors that are written at one time. A session is a group of tracks that are recorded at the same time. The table of contents records the location of the start address, the session number, track information on a CD. If the table of contents cannot be read, the disk will not be recognized. With regard specifically to CDRWs, a full erase deletes all data on a disk, while a quick erase will only remove the references to tracks and sessions, leaving everything else unchanged. There are a variety of tools that can read the orphan data. DVDs were created by Philips, Sony, Toshiba, Time Warner, and others. And they hold between 4.7 gigabytes and 17 gigabytes of data. A DVD uses a red laser of 650 nanometers to read the data. There are two types of DVDs. Who can name them? Uh, no, not between DVD and HD DVD. I mean, DVD itself. There are two types of DVD. It is not read and rewritable. Nope. But you're getting warmer. ROM and RAM, nope. Single and double-sided, nope. Two competing types. Correct, Pedro. Minus R and plus R. What is the difference between the minus R and the plus R? Uh, nope. The difference between minus and plus is not single and dual layer. Record one time only? Nope. Encoding type, kind of. The chief difference between minus R and plus R is minus R was made by the DVD Alliance, which are the Philips, the Toshibas, the Time Warners, and, and a bunch of other companies that came together and said, we're going to make a standard a DVD standard that we're all going to agree to, and we're all going to make DVDs the same way. The plus R was the one person who doesn't like to play well with others and likes to have toys all for himself is Sony. Sony made the plus R to complete with minus R. Funny enough, most uh, manufacturers just made players that can read and write to both. But that is the difference between the two. 
if Minus R was made by everybody who was getting along together, and Sony said, I don't want to play with y'all, I'm going to make my own. Blu-ray. A single layer blue disc, or blue drive, blue, blue drive, blue drive, man. A single layer Blu-ray disc can store 25 gigs with the dual layer storing 50. And it uses the blue laser, that's why it's called the Blu-ray, to read the disc. Hey, look, it's the save button. Once again, I'll remind you, just because it's ancient doesn't mean it's dead. There are plenty of organizations that still use floppies and still rely on them to do their business. Do your best not to make fun of them. Because hey, they're still around, they're still making money. More power to them. Have y'all seen this? A zip drive. This is supposed to be the higher capacity alternative to floppies. And May I also remind you, since we are on the magnetic area, there is also magnetic tapes. Tapes you will still find heavily used. Tapes have an extremely long shelf life when they're not read and written over and over again. They are absolutely useful and reliable for long-term storage. They take forever and a day to read from, but they can store huge amounts of data, much more than a, than a, a hard drive or a solid state, and store that data for a very long period of time. Tape drives are awesome against ransomware. So if you are if you are backing your systems up to a tape and you are sticking them in a cabinet, in a locked cabinet, and one day you get hit by ransomware because some user decided to click on a phishing link and it hit your server and, and everything's at a ransom, stick the tape drive, let it play overnight and rebuild your entire infrastructure, and then go back and figure out uh, who did it and, and how they got in and, and uh, knock them out. Do not discount tape drives. Any questions on the lecture? No, no questions? Okie dokie. On your to-do list this week, do not panic, number one. Let's start there. Do not panic. Do not freak out. I have a list of videos for you to watch because you're going to get trained in how to use autopsy. You're going to be going back to this page often if you don't just download everything all at once. 
Uh, this has all the cases you're going to be working with. Not starting next week. Oh, actually, yes. Next week, you have some labs that you'll do. And then you have three cases to work through. And then we reach the second half of the year or the semester to work on cases. This is where using a cloud system is most encouraged. Because this is gigabytes of stuff that has to get downloaded. And when it expands, it's going to expand much bigger than the zip file itself. Case in point is the lone wolf. I believe it's a 30 gig download and it expands to 60 gigabytes. Number one, I don't want to download 30 gigabytes down from my home network. And number two, I don't want to use 90 gigabytes of storage locally if I don't need to. But that's why I gave you cloud credit so that you can use this, the backbone of Google's internet and use their storage absolutely free. So take advantage of that. Throughout the week, my honest suggestion is to download all these suckers into a Windows machine so that you have them all ready to go as you need them. Now for this week, this week specifically, you need to download these videos and you can do an MD5 sum to make sure you did download the thing uh, completely. There are a bunch of videos to watch and there, a, there is a quiz for most of them. A section zero video doesn't have a quiz and section 10 has a different name. It used to be correlation engine module, now it's called central repository. But what you'll do is essentially you watch a video like section one, and then you do the quiz for it. And then you watch section two video and you do the quiz for that. And you move along section by section, video by video. The videos are not long. They tend to be about five minutes each, give or take. Um, I don't suggest uh, watching all the videos and then doing the quizzes. I suggest doing one, one each, one each, one each, one each. I see a question. I didn't see Windows 10 on GCP. Do we download autopsy and these files on Windows Server? Absolutely, yes. Download them on Windows Server. Windows Server is Windows 10. The difference is it has different roles and features. And it looks a little different, but they are the same OS. Any questions on the main work of the week? I highly encourage you to download everything from the labs through all the cases into a GCP system, into a, the, into a GCP Windows Server instance. That way you save yourself the bandwidth to download to home and the storage downloading to home. Because you don't need to do all that, all that wear and tear on your local system if you have free access to cloud systems. Let Google handle that.
Um, I would in the virtual machine, go to this site, just um, class.infosecurban.info, and then click on DF pages or DF cases page. And then just click them to download them. So do it, do it in that virtual machine, not outside. That way it all happens out there and not at all on your system. Yeah, save, save your system, save your bandwidth. But that'll help you stay ahead of the game for all the upcoming labs that you'll be doing. Shouldn't take that long happening over Google's backbone. But yeah, download the videos locally so you can watch them and then do a quiz at a time. And while that happens in the background, in your cloud VM, start the download for all these suckers so that you have them ready for next week when we start working on labs. So I'm going to stop the stream. And I know that we have a couple of questions on getting set up on the cloud and using different tools. So we're going to take the time to do